We long for Beulah Land. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to Acts chapter number 1. Acts chapter number 1 in your Bibles this morning. You know, one of the most notable impacts of COVID-19 has been its hit on personal relationships, on face-to-face -face time with real people in the same room, interactions with people and that don't involve... Uh, technological gadgetry. Why is it difficult to lose personal relationship? I believe the most profound reason why it's difficult to lose personal relationship is because we were created in the image of God. And all you've got to do is read the first couple of chapters in the Bible and you know God is a relational person. We read that after he created Adam and Eve, he would walk in the cool of the evening through the garden with them. They would spend quality time together, a quantity of time together in personal relationship. That's my God. He's a God of personal relationship. He's a God of social interaction. He's a God of closeness with people. And that's the image that he created us in. We are created in the image of an amazingly personal, relational God. And it's that reason why Christianity thrives on relationships. Relationships that are strengthened. When we spend time together, a church facility merely becomes a place where the people of God gather to spend personal time together. We come together oftentimes in the good old days, multiple times a week to meet together, to eat together, to sing together, to fellowship together, to study God's word together, to pray together. And Christianity thrives on that personal relationship because that's our God. And he created us in his image. Out of this place, we build relationships and then leave this place and often do life together before coming back for another time in this place. All of this springs from the relational nature of our relationship with God and his family that breaks forth from our salvation that brought us into this amazing relational experience. As a matter of fact, in the epistle of 1 John, one of the evidences that a person has been genuinely born again is that they love their brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's held up in the eternal word of God as one of the three evidences that a person is genuinely saved. It's relational. It's time together. It's personal. It's loving one another and doing life together. Well, that's why at the core of our relationship with God is this amazing interaction we call prayer. Prayer is the heart of our relational experience with our God. Prayer is nothing more than my heavenly Father and I spending time together, talking about things we both enjoy. 
Prayer is the heart of the relationship of a believer and the God who saved that believer from eternal hell. Prayer is the core of our relationship. So let me ask you a question. How was your prayer life this last week? We're starting a brand new week, which means everything's brand new. His mercies are new every morning. It's a brand new week. It's a brand new day. No strikes against you. How was it last week? How was your prayer life? Did you spend quality time last week in personal relationship interaction between you and your God? In that quality time that you spent together with God last week, did God minister to you and did you find yourself growing in your awareness of how he thinks and what is important to him? How was your prayer life last week? What is the core of your relationship with God? These things are really, really important. And so important is prayer that Jesus Christ spent a lot of time teaching his disciples during his earthly ministry how to pray. How did he do that? Well, he, he, first of all, he taught them how to pray by modeling prayer in front of them. He allowed them to eavesdrop when he was engaging his Father in heaven in prayer. He also taught them by giving them line upon line precepts about how to pray. We call that the Lord's Prayer commonly. He also told stories and illustrations that would help them to understand some precept or principle about prayer, take it out of the theoretical and put flesh and bones on it in a real life illustration. For those who love alliteration, that means Jesus Christ taught his disciples to pray by performance, by precept, and by parable. Prayer was important to Jesus Christ. And he taught his disciples how to pray on many occasions. Every week I, I try. I, I don't do a real good job at it, but I try to follow Jesus' example as the under-shepherd he has placed here at Community Baptist Church as I try to teach you how to pray. I try to teach you how to pray by encouraging you to use Community Baptist Church's weekly prayer sheets. We publish six of them every week, one for every one of our six adult small groups, life stage groups. They go from, this is our, our, the torch prayer sheet, torch 516. This is our teens because you know the greatest thing that we can teach a teenager is how to engage God in prayer. If we can teach a teenager how to engage God meaningfully in prayer, that can change their entire life. And, and Jesus Christ, in teaching us how to pray, gave us five prayer topics. And every one of our prayer sheets follows the five prayer topics that Jesus taught his disciples. And the first one is that we ought to always start our prayer time by praising God. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This last week, if you've got your prayer sheet early in the week, if your Bible study fellowship teacher emailed you your prayer sheet and you printed that out or put that on your uh, electronic device and have used that this week, then you this week have meditated on God as the sustainer who has sustained your life every day this week. Praise God for his sustaining grace in my life every day. You also meditated on God as a merciful God who is all-powerful, omnipotent. God is powerful enough to do anything that needs to be done in your life, and he's merciful, and he cares about you. You also meditated on the name of God, Jehovah Makedesh, from Leviticus chapter 8. I went back and read Leviticus chapter 8 again this week as I was meditating on the name Jehovah Makedesh. It means Jehovah sanctifies me. He's the God who's the source of making me holy so that I can be like him. You meditated on God. You praised his name. You honored him. You spent time dialoguing with him about who he is to you. He's your sustainer, what he's like. He's merciful and omnipotent. And what he revealed in his name 
He's the God who helped me to be holy this week. And then the second prayer topic that you prayed and, and conversed with God about is thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What in the world does that mean? Did you pray this week as Jesus taught you to? Did you spend time praying this week, God, thy kingdom come? If you did, what did you mean by that? Fill in the blanks. Give me the paragraph. That's the phrase, thy kingdom come. Explain it to me. What did you dialogue and talk to God about this week? About the coming of his kingdom. This is the second of the five prayer topics that Jesus Christ talked to us about talking to our Father about. But what does it mean to pray, thy kingdom come? Oh, that's kind of the bottom line up front or bottom line in the middle here. Thy kingdom come, what does that mean? In the few moments we have left, I want you to grab hold of an understanding of what it means to talk to God about his kingdom. Jesus expects you to talk to the Father every week about it. God's kingdom. He's instructed you to talk to God every week, every day maybe, about God's kingdom. He's told you to pray, thy kingdom come. What does that mean? How do you do that? What do you say? What do you talk about? Well, it ought to be simple enough, but, but we've got some major problems in modern day Christianity that's developed over a lot of hundreds of years, and that is that because of the heretical teachings of the Roman Catholic Church that was, that was reworked but maintained in the Protestant Reformation, there has been this idea of the kingdom that is not what we read in the Bible regarding what the kingdom is. And the result of that, one of the results of that, has been rapid anti-Semitism that has scourged our world for 2,000 years. And is being rebirthed around the world today. Even in our own country. Our many American universities are hotbeds of anti-Semitism. Even in our United States Congress. Anti-Semitism has raised its ugly head in recent times. You see what the kingdom of God is. When it is divorced from the simple teachings of scripture has produced an environment in which the Jews are a nobody. The Jewish people have no purpose in the plan of God. They were 2,000 years ago rejected by God, set aside as a nobody, as a no people, as a non-entity. And Gentile Christians have been put in their place. It's called replacement theology by some. We Gentile Christians, we get all of the promises God made to the Jewish people. And the Jewish people get all of the curses God made to the Jewish people. And so the kingdom of God becomes obscure. It becomes confused. It becomes something that is divorced from the reality of the teaching of scripture and so when Jesus expects me every day to talk to God about the coming of his kingdom so many don't even know what it is and they don't even know what to talk to God about do you know what the kingdom is do you know how to talk to God about the coming of his kingdom is the kingdom of God real to you you know, our kids need to know what the kingdom of God is because our kids need to know why anti-Semitism is a tool of Satan to destroy the people group that God used to give us our Savior and our Bible. A people group that God has great plans in the future for. Our kids need to know what the kingdom of God is to escape the scourge of anti-Semitism that plagues our world. What is the kingdom of God? And so I've invited you to Acts chapter 1 to a place where Jesus Christ is just about to ascend back to the Father in heaven. He's completed his ministry. He's died on the cross. He's risen from the grave. He's spent 40 days teaching and now he's about ready to ascend and go back to heaven. And saturating Acts chapter 1 is the kingdom of God. 
Well, look at it with me in Acts chapter 1. In verse number 3, the Bible says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days. What did he do for 40 days? What saturated the, the mind of Jesus for 40 days? What did he teach and talk about for 40 days? Verse number 3 says that they were... He was seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so it was only reasonable in verse number 6 that the apostles would ask Jesus, is it today? Are you going to restore the kingdom today? It's been 40 days since you rose from the grave. You've been telling us about this amazing kingdom. You've been telling us all this that pertains to the kingdom. Are you going to do it today? Are you going to today restore the kingdom to Israel? Interesting question. Coming from the disciples just before Jesus ascended back to heaven. What can we learn about the kingdom of God from this amazing moment in time in which Jesus Christ has concluded a 40-day advanced seminary crash course on the kingdom of God. Well, I want to borrow an outline from Chris Katolpa, Katolka of the Friends of Israel gospel ministry that was published in a recent issue of Israel My Glory. It was just a short article. That's hope for you. <laughs> it was a short article. And in that short article, there were three facts that were identified about Acts chapter 1 conversation that just captivated my mind. And I want you to just see these three facts. The first fact is that they asked the right question. When they asked, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Oh, Israel had had a wonderful kingdom. You, we, can, we read the Old Testament. We read about the amazing kingdom under David's leadership. We read about the amazing kingdom under Solomon's leadership. We read uh, about times where, where they had great revivals and great kingdom. But it never, it never, it never reached the point where all of the promises God had made to Israel had been fulfilled. God had yet to fulfill the promises in their entirety that he had promised them. And then Israel would sin and God would judge them. And, and now the disciples, the apostles, who have just concluded 40 days of a crash course on the kingdom of God, they're, they're asking the question, is, is this the time? Are you going to establish the kingdom here in Jerusalem? Are, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? I want you to understand they asked the right question. Now why do I say they asked the right question? Because I say it that way because throughout the result of Catholic and Protestant theology, theologians of the Reformed tradition have sometimes said of that question that the apostles were ignorant because they actually thought the kingdom involved a real, pa a real people and a real king and a real place and a real nation. And therefore, since that doesn't fit their theological framework of what they created, they say the apostles were ignorant. Ignorant? They just spent 40 days in a seminary crash course on the kingdom of God, and they asked the logical question, and you who have never sat down and face-to-face and -face had Jesus teach you what the kingdom is, you say they're ignorant? No, I say they asked the right question. They asked the right question because they understood from all of their scripture that generation after generation longed for the fulfillment of the promises that God had made to the people that he identified as his people that would produce the Messiah of the world and the Bible for the world.
this Jesus Christ, maybe he'll fulfill the promises finally. The promises of the Abrahamic covenant, the promises of the Palestinian covenant, the promises of the Mosaic covenant, the promises of the Davidic covenant, the promises of the new covenant. Maybe, maybe, maybe finally the Messiah is going to finally restore the kingdom we've been looking for for generations. If you could take just a, just a moment to flip back to Matthew chapter 1, let me show you that the New Testament opened with a, with a declaration that the Old Testament Messiah had finally come. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 1, the Bible says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Verse number 16, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Verse 17, generations from Abraham to David are 14. David till the carrying away of Babylon, 14. Carrying away of Babylon to Christ. Verse 18, the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, you do understand, don't you, that Christ is not Jesus' last name. I'm Mike Elstock. Elstock is my last name. I am Mike, born into the headship, under the headship of Lloyd Elstock. I am Mike Elstock. It's my last name. Christ is not Jesus' last name. He was not born under the headship of a human father named Christ. No, Christ is a title. It's the Greek title that is the corresponding word to the Hebrew title Messiah. And when you say Jesus Christ, what you're saying is Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. Amen. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. And over and over again in Matthew chapter 1, to begin the New Testament, God announced the Messiah is here. Generations have looked for this day. The Messiah is here. Jesus, the Christ. In chapter 3, John the Baptist began to preach the kingdom is at hand. Why? Because the Messiah is here. A chapter later, Jesus Christ began to preach the kingdom is at hand. Why? Because the Messiah is here. Jesus is the promised Messiah. Oh, one of my favorite. It ranks up there. Got to be one of my favorite Christmas cantatas. Is the cantata Journey of Hope. That, that capitalizes on this generation after generation. Longing for the Messiah. Longing for the coming of the Messiah. Longing for the Messiah to come. Restore the kingdom that God promised the descendants of Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob, who was renamed Israel, who had the 12 sons of Israel, who had the 12 families of Israel, who grew into the 12 tribes of Israel. And generation after generation, the people of God longed for the coming Messiah that would restore again with all full promised blessings the kingdom of Israel. They long for it. I say they asked the right question. They understood what they were asking. Because they understood their Bible, the Old Testament. And because they just graduated from a 40-day advanced seminary crash course entitled The Kingdom of God, taught by none other than the Messiah himself. They knew what they were asking, and they asked the right question. Is it time for the Messiah to fulfill all the promises and restore the kingdom to the nation of Israel here in the capital city of Jerusalem? Here's a second fact. The second fact is they asked this right question at the right time. You see, Jesus had 
been rejected by the nation of Israel. They rejected their Messiah. They crucified him. He rose again on the third day. And you'll remember in Luke chapter 24 when Jesus Christ, the afternoon of his resurrection day, so Sunday afternoon of resurrection Sunday, Jesus Christ knew there were two disciples who were walking down a road from Jerusalem heading to the village of Emmaus. And Jesus caught up with them, didn't allow them to recognize him as to who he was. He just kind of joined their little party, and they were really confused. And Jesus asked them what the, what the problem was. And they said, what do you mean what the problem is? Are you a stranger around here? Are you new to Jerusalem? The Messiah! We thought it was him. We, we thought he was here, but they crucified him. They put him to death. And then, and that wasn't enough, this is the third day, and there's some women that say they went to the tomb and it's empty, and they can't find the body. And some angels said, he's risen from the grave. Amen. And then Jesus Christ said, oh, you are so slow to believe all that the prophets have taught about the kingdom of God. And so he began to open the Old Testament scriptures to them, quoting passage after passage after passage throughout the Old Testament. He said it this way, ought not Christ to have suffered these things? Shouldn't listen to Isaiah 53 again. Let's go back and rehearse the scriptures. Ought not the Messiah have suffered like this? in order to enter into his glory? Doesn't your scriptures teach you that the Messiah will come as a suffering lamb, but he'll also come as a roaring lion leading forth to conquer? Oh, Peter said that the Old Testament preachers were confused by their own sermons. Well, I can relate to that. Sometimes after I preach, I say, what in the world was that? Peter said the Old Testament preachers were confused about their own sermons. They did not understand how that the Messiah could both suffer and be glorified. Then they wrestled. And Jesus, first Peter says that, that they didn't preach those sermons for their benefit. They preached those sermons for our benefit on this side of the resurrection. So that we can look back and understand what God's plan for his kingdom always was. Jesus Christ needed to suffer and die for the sins of mankind. And after that will come the glory of his glorious kingdom. That was in Luke chapter 24. Luke 24 ends by, by the, the, uh, those, those, those disciples all joining Jesus Christ up on the Mount of Olives where Jesus will ascend. So I, I'm, I'm saying this morning that, that Jesus that the men asked the right question. They fully understood what Jesus had taught about the kingdom. They asked the right question. They asked the right question at the right time. Because this is the time after the glorification of Jesus Christ that they, they would have thought, what's, what's keeping it now? What's holding it back now? Is this the time it was the right time to ask that question. And then one final fact. Not only did they write, not only did they ask the right question at the right time, but they asked the right question at the right time at the right place. At the right place. They were walking up a hill after having crossed the Kidron Valley, after leaving the city of Jerusalem. If you read it in the last chapter of Luke's gospel, which links to the first chapter of Acts, Luke said they went up to Bethany. Bethany is the village on top of the Mount of Olives. As they would go up the Mount of Olives from the Kidron Valley, they would come to the village of Bethany. And Luke says that's where they were going. And so here they are walking up the Mount of Olives from the city of Jerusalem. Uh, they, they are approaching the Mount of Olives and it's at that place. It's at that place. It's at that place. 
that they ask the right question at the right time. You say, why is it the right place? Because these were not ignorant men. They knew their Bibles. They knew that their preacher, Zechariah, in Zechariah chapter 14, had said, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of of olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west and there shall be a very great valley and half the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south they knew they were standing on the very spot at the very place where their preachers had preached to them this is this place where the Messiah will plant his feet when he comes to establish his kingdom in Israel. And they were standing on that spot with the Messiah who had just concluded a 40-day crash course on the kingdom of God. And they said, is it time? Is this the time? We're at the right place. It seems to be the right time. We know the right question. Lord, will you establish the kingdom for Israel and fulfill all the covenant promises of the Old Testament? Will you do it today, Lord? They ask the right question. They ask it at the right place. And they ask it at the right time. Oh, there's so much we need to learn about this. Maybe in some future Sunday evening services, we'll explore more deeply this question of thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus expects me to talk to God every day about the coming of his kingdom. Oh, the disciples, they wanted to know and it's amazing the answer Jesus gave to them. He said, ah, no, guys, you failed the course. 40 days of teaching you a bunch of ignorant guys, and you still don't get it. There's not going to be a literal kingdom on a literal earth with a literal Israel in a literal city of Jerusalem. You guys have been confused. You got it all wrong. What have you been listening to for 40 days? No, Jesus didn't correct their false theology. Their theology was dead on Jesus Christ simply said it's not the right time for you to understand he didn't question what the kingdom is he just said it's not time for you to know when the kingdom will be and so when you pray and when you talk to God the Father about the things that Jesus told you to talk to the Father about and you talk to the Father about the coming of his kingdom, right. you are praying very much in sync with the last couple of verses of the book of Revelation. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Would you come and establish your kingdom? Would you come and do the work in the world that needs to be done to judge a rejecting world and to fulfill the covenant promises and establish Israel, the people of the Jews and their land as your kingdom on earth? Would you bring your kingdom? God, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done. Lord, would you come again and establish your kingdom in Israel? And so Jesus Christ looked at the disciples and he said, guys, you got the right theology. It's just not time yet for me to start it right now. But I got a plan. I got something I want you to do. From today until the day that I come back to the Mount of Olives the next time, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go all over Jerusalem. Go to every house. Go to every street corner. Go to every business establishment. Go everywhere in Jerusalem. And then, and then I want you to branch out into the country. Take the, the little roadways that lead to the villages all over Judea. And go to every village in Judea. And, and, and then go north. Go, go up into Samaria. And, and go all through Samaria. 
and, 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 then, and then just go to the outermost parts of the earth. What do you want us to do, Lord? I want you to be a witness and tell people what I did in your life. A witness is someone who's experienced and knows by firsthand experience the truth of something. They are a witness to something. And if you're saved, you are a witness to what Jesus Christ did to rescue you from hell and to put you on a road to heaven for all of eternity. And you are a witness of what he did. Now go tell everybody about it. Go, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all over the world until my feet plant on the Mount of Olives the next time, I want you to saturate the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thy kingdom come. And in the meantime, the work of your kingdom is to get that message to the world. Would you talk to God this week about his kingdom? Would you follow Jesus' teaching and talk to God about his kingdom? And as you talk to God about his kingdom... Would you interact with people and tell them what he did in your life? Maybe you can grab some of those true life cards on your way out and ask God to make a divine appointment with five people that you can put into their hands an avenue of truth that will lead them to the reality of what Jesus Christ did for you. I'm Thank you for joining us for part of a Sunday service at Community Baptist Church. I hope to meet you soon. May God impress His love upon your heart this week.